To put it lightly, I was a basket case leading up to my sentencing hearing in 2007. I had no idea the sentence I was going to get, what the rest of my life would look like because of my conviction. And as it turns out, I am not alone conveying these, these thoughts or message to you because yesterday while running, I received a call from a journalist in Chicago who, like many people or journalists, are covering the Jesse Smollett sentencing on March 10th. And this journalist was essentially like, so what is, like, what is he doing leading up to sentencing? What should a defendant be doing? Can you answer? I'm like, of course I can answer. This is what our team does. I would love to answer. Can I finish this brutal six mile run and I'll call you when I'm done? She said, sure. And I wanted to memorialize some of these thoughts on Monday, February 21st. Before I do, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this channel. At White Collar Advice, please like and subscribe. Leave favorable comments. And if you have unfavorable comments, don't leave them because my children, when they get older, will read them. And I'm just kidding. Say what you want to say as long as it makes our channel better. So let's dive in with what Jesse Smollett should be doing as he advances towards his sentencing on March 10th. So as you could imagine, justices who like smell like many defendants have hired very expensive lawyers. And the problem with some very expensive lawyers, to be clear, not indicting all, all lawyers, but the problem with some lawyers is they're like, I got this. I got this all covered. I'm a former U.S. attorney. I, I ran that division for 20 years. There's nothing I don't know about this judge. And I got this covered. So in so doing, some defendants, can I say, they get a little bit lazy. They're like, oh, I hired this former U.S. attorney or former district attorney. I'm all good. So they outsource all of the work. The unfortunate part is the messaging we have heard from judges all across America is they want defendants to do the work. Whether you're convicted or trial or not, it doesn't matter. Even if you're convicted at trial, as Jesse was, you still have to demonstrate who you are, what you've learned, why you'll never return to another courtroom. Influences that could have led you there. Influences, in his case, that led him to acting and overcoming significant odds in both the music and film career, he has overcome. He has done some great things. But if the judge doesn't hear it from him, uh, no bueno, no good. That's a huge problem. So what he should not be doing leading up to sentencing is outsourcing all of the work to lawyers. Quick disclosure, kids are off school today. There's a chance one or both of my kids run in and disrupt the video, but we're going to keep rolling. My awesome wife, thankfully, is I think trying to get them fed. I'm not sure, but it's about to get noisy. Getting back. Only Jussie Smollett can do the work. And this comes from judges. For example, our team interviewed federal judge Stephen Boo, a district judge in Missouri. And in that video, he told my business partner, Michael Santos, that if someone breaks his window, don't say I'm sorry, what are the plans to break the window? Again, the defendant has to do the work. And I'm gonna get into in a moment what that means for him. Further, Judge Boo told us that lawyers are paid to talk about why they're you know, defendant, their client is worthy of leniency, that they're paid to, to say it. So whether you have a public defender, or you've hired the best lawyer in America, they're paid to say it. For example, there was a judge one time who told me, you know, if the, the, the defendant's a bad guy, the lawyer's paid to say he's a good guy. If he's a bad husband, the lawyer's paid to say he's a good husband. If he didn't have, even if he had intentions to rob and break the law, the lawyer's paid to say, well, he didn't have bad intentions. I mean, who really wakes with the idea to break the law and go to prison? They're paid to say it. So while I want people to have good counsel, it doesn't absolve them of the responsibility of doing what Mr. Smollett should be doing towards sentencing. Putting himself in the perspective or shoes of the stakeholder. Well, who are they? Good question. And I'm in a position to answer that question. The judge is a stakeholder. What is the judge's perception of Jesse Smollett? Well, I mean, only he can influence that process. The perception in the media right now, not great. The perception is that he lied on the stage, on the stage, forgive me, lied on the stand in front of this judge. Perception is not great that to advance his own career, he staged this hate crime to the expense of the city of Chicago, to his fans, to the trust, to real people who will someday suffer from hate crimes who may not want to come forward because of this. That's the perspective this judge may have. So it's in Mr. Smollett's interest to try to influence this primary stakeholder, the judge, positively. Well, how can he do that? Certainly he can do that by writing a lengthy narrative that he explains in his own words who he is, where he's going, what he's learned, how this case has impacted not just him. All these defendants are, I did this terribly. It's me and my life is imploding. I didn't mean to do it. I sent my nice mom to therapy and, you know, I'm fat and bloated because I eat all day and it's like it's not my fault and I didn't mean to do it and I never thought about the victims ever. Not great for the stakeholders, the judge, so it requires him getting out of his own mind and thinking about how his own life is imploding and putting himself in the shoes of other people, people who trusted him, people he hurt, and in a very thoughtful manner, articulating that while he doesn't have it all figured out today, 
it's a path that he's going to work on for the rest of his life. And well past sentencing, he's going to continue to work on it and prove worthy of a second chance, prove worthy of an opportunity to do better, to, to work again. So what I suggest, our team would suggest you do is, in his own words, don't outsource it to the lawyers. Please, I'm begging you, do not outsource it to the lawyers. They're paid to say it. He has to articulate in his own words by way of a narrative. could also be a sentencing video, though some of these sentencing videos tend to look like you know, bar mitzvah reels or you know, wedding wedding videos of photos in your AYSO jersey when you're eight. It kind of pulls with the heartstrings, but I don't think it's mitigation. I don't think it's game changing. It's kind of boilerplate. He has to identify who he is, what he's learned, why he'll never return to another courtroom and put himself in the shoes of people that will be that will be judging him. That also includes the prosecutors who may be, may be recommending a, a prison term. The sentencing statement that, that he makes, sort of a big deal. Again, a lot of lawyers are like, hey, you can't say anything, man. You know, you, 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 this, this happened recently with a client convicted at trial. The lawyer's like, hey, you can't say anything. You, you were convicted at trial. You're appealing. If you say anything, this judge, you're going to jeopardize your right to an appeal. It's like, no, you can still articulate a message to the sentencing judge without jeopardizing your right to an appeal, which is I suppose he will be appealing. But he can still speak honestly to, to the judge in a way that demonstrates that he understands the perception of others. And while he may not accept responsibility, he can still articulate details of his life that only he can give. It was Judge Benita Pearson who told uh, our team on stage in 2016, you know what, Justin? It's the defendant's job to tell us every detail or fracture of their life. Even if you're born rich and privileged, there's some fracture that compelled you to break the law. If you grew up in poverty, with trauma, parents in prison, that is a different message. If adversity has been a part of your life, that's a different message. There are indeed things that he has overcome. He reached a level of success that is unparalleled in many ways. And he's, that's phenomenal. That's, that's work ethic. That's discipline. That's talent. That's commitment. But if he doesn't portray that message in a deferential, humble way, he's going to be judged by that the hate crime accident that he staged. That's the singular focus. That's all they're going to focus on. And by the way, if he is unable to embrace this message of articulating in his own words why he's worthy of leniency, if he only outsources it to the lawyer, it's not just going to land him in prison. It's going to influence what happens to him in prison. And then if he doesn't embrace a different messaging through his own efforts moving forward, the worst part follows. Whether it gets probation, three months, six months, or nine months, it's a life sentence in many ways because he'll come home he won't be able to work because people aren't going to embrace his message that's full of lying and deceit and putting Jussie first. There are a lot of people who get the probation outcome they want, the three months or six months, but they've never invested the time to own their story. They're not introspective. They haven't taken the time to examine the influences that led them there, so they default to boilerplate, I didn't mean to do it, or it wasn't me, I was set up, it was the government. They default to rationalizations or excuses where people may say, hey, I get it, man, I'm sorry, but it doesn't doesn't inspire people to want to help you. So I would encourage him to begin investing the time through his own efforts to fully examine what led him here and to own it, man. I'm telling you to own it. My life only changed. Our clients, the people on our team, it only began to change when we were able to look at our family, at our loved ones and say, I made bad decisions. I knew better. And I am convinced. I know some of you have called me crazy. I've seen the comments. Thank you, by the way. It's very nice of you to call me crazy. Some people have said you're nuts, you're too Pollyannish, you're too optimistic. Don't forget, our team has done this for 13 years. We've worked with more than 1,000 people. We've been to 1,000 sentencing hearings. We've learned a lot. A lot of people, like Lance Armstrong, who fortunately avoided, who luckily avoided prison, may maintain their innocence, but at some point, they, they'll say, I just can't go on any longer. This has to end. That will happen here. Mark this date. It will happen. I guarantee it. If he ever wants to work again, if he ever wants to make money again, if he wants people to remain in his support network, if he wants to grow that support network, I guarantee you it's going to happen. The quicker it happens, the better. The quicker it happens, he'll begin to feel a sense of, it's frankly very cathartic to finally come clean. I heard Lance Armstrong on the Howard Stern Show and he's talking openly and honestly about this many years late, but you could hear how freeing he felt, that it was great to finally come clean. So as I close this video on what he should be doing for sentencing, I'm gonna close with one additional point. Before I do, he's got to do the work in his own words. Please, I'm begging you. I'm begging you. Do not outsource the work to lawyers. Cannot do it. Unless he wants to get a longer prison term, which frankly some people are adamant about doing. People make decisions that get them further away than what they actually want, which is avoid going to prison. He needs to create a win-win. Very simple message. I'm not claiming that it's altruistic for him to 
come clean and suddenly come contribute to his community and that it's all about other people. It's okay in life to create a win-win. It would be a win-win if at some point he could say, I knew better and I am sorry. Here is my path to do better with accountability metrics, right? Accountability metrics. This is where I'll be in five years. This is how I'm going to work my way back. This is how I'm going to hold myself accountable every day. It is a win for him because he gets back on track with his family, with his career, with people who say, yeah, he's earning a second chance. He ain't just talking about it. He's doing it. It's a win for him. But it's also a win for everyone in his community. It's a win for a judge that can say, okay, people, he made some bad choices. He's finally coming clean. It's a win for others down the road who have blamed and excused others and said it's never too late to accept responsibility. It can be inspirational and a win for others to say if he can do it through such denial for such a long period of time, if he can do it, then I can do it. All of you traversing the criminal justice system seek to create, first understand the stakeholders, seek to create a win-win and do not outsource the work to the lawyers. Do not do it, unless of course you want to go to a longer prison sentence. Uh, that are, those are some of the thoughts I conveyed to the journalist yesterday. They're thoughts I'm happy to convey with you today and welcome the feedback, criticism, and suggestions. Be well, be safe. Goodbye.